Hi everyone, this is your second Ed Puzzle for semester number two from Machaloka to Rebellion, a history of Jewish opposition. So let's go forward and let's start again with our terms that we should know. So Machaloka means, there it is, disagreement. Machaloka l'shem shamayi means, Machaloket she'eno l'shem shamaye means a koshi or a kushia means a terutz means ben tsere means to be chayav means oops, sorry I'll move me to be chayav means to be patur means de oraita means and de rabbanan means all right. So um, again, once more, a review of our of our Mishnah, a stubborn and rebellious child. When does someone become a stubborn and rebellious child is the question the Mishnah asks. And we give our first answer. From a moment that there it comes two pubic hairs until a beard surrounds his genitals, then as it is said in the Torah, there will be for a man a son, a son and not a daughter, meaning that what? What about it? Why aren't we including a daughter in the definition of Ben Sarai Then it says, oh, because it says there will be to a son, to a man, a son, a son, and not a man. So who are we now excluding from the definition of Ben Sarai And the young child is Pator, okay? Because he is not yet to become included as one who can be commanded. Now, we talked in class about there being a specific ritual. There's a life, a life, t- a, 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 a point in your life where you are not commanded and a point in your life where you're commanded to do mitzvot. What moment is that? That's a life cycle event, an important life cycle event in Jewish history, in Jewish, in the Jewish life of someone. And by the way, if you have no idea, just look up important life cycle events. And you'll see it happens around the age of 12 or 13 to get your answer. By the way, we had all, so we have not one, not two, not three, four different ways of now limiting or defining or narrowing the definition of who can be a Ben Sorer Umore. And in that case, also narrowing who can actually be killed for being a Ben Saramara. So this Mishnah does a tremendous amount to narrow who it could be. By the way, if you were writing, if you were the writer of this Mishnah and you were trying to write it in a way that could be best memorized, would you write it from the least limiting to the most limiting? Or would you write it from the most limiting to the least limiting? Right? How would you kind of order your Mishnah? And so that's a hard question, but, and, and so a, um, and, and my question is here is, is there an order to, when we look at the mission, is one of these orders in place here, most limiting to least limiting, least limiting to most limiting, or is it just completely random? So that's going to be a multiple choice. A, most limiting to least limiting, B, least limiting to most limiting, C, completely random. And because remember, um, obviously, this was this used to be not something written down. This was something orally. I would whisper it to someone, or I would say it to someone, and they would need to remember it. So, what's the way that we can actually remember it? Remember it. And so, I, my next question is: Why do you think actually this is of all these different possibilities? A son, right? Uh, a Ben Sorer Mura has to be a son, not a daughter. Ben Sorer Mura has to be a son, not a man. Ben Sorer can't be a child because it says son um, and a ben sorera more has to be in the time of puberty why do you think puberty is first right why do you think puberty is first and by the way so if we remember generally we said this isn't a, a certain time in life this is a gender this is a certain time in life and this is a certain time in life so we have time time gender time weird how come it's not time, 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 gender, or gender, time, 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 time? Okay, um, so that, that's my question. It's a hard one. 
um, see what you can do with it. I'm interested in hearing your kind of ideas as you kind of think and look at this Mishnah. By the way, what I hope that you are seeing is I'm actually trying to look at the Mishnah as if it was Torah. I'm trying to ask, why is this written and why is this not written? How, why is it written in this certain order? Why is it the way it is? And that's going to be our key to looking at Mishnah. If we can look at it as if it is a holy text, as if each and every word is really important, then we're going to see, then it will help us understand the Talmud, because the Talmud does exactly that. The Talmud tries to say each and every word is important, right? One important principle um, of, of looking at the Torah is something called omni-significance, meaning God is not a blabbermouth. We, I think we talked about that before. God is not a blabbermouth. And what does that actually mean? God is not a blabbermouth. It means omni-significance. But omni-significance is a hard word. So it means God is not a blabbermouth, which means what? Yeah, it means that each and every word means something. That God didn't just talk forever. Actually, the Torah is kind of small. So every single word matters. What is in there? What isn't in there? Why did God choose one way of saying it versus another way of saying it? And uh, we're going we're gonna to come back to that in, in a little bit. And so when the Talmud looks at the Mishnah, try to understand it, it's going to ask a lot of the same questions. For instance, wait. One, the very first Mishnah in the entire, entire set, six books of Mishnah is, says the following. When are we supposed to say the Shema in the evening? That's the line. When should we say the Shema in the evening? Me'ematai karimat Shema ba'aravit. Okay, now before I ask the question, I will tell you this. The Shema, just like it says in the, in the Via Hafta, in the Shema, in the Via Hafta, it tells us we're supposed to say the Shema two times during the day. When we get up and when we lie down. Early in the morning, first thing, and at night. So the very first line of the very first Mishnah is, when do we say the Shema at night? And of course, the Talmud has a big question about this, right? The Talmud asks the question, what's the question the Talmud asks? Ah, and the Talmud asks, why would you begin with night? Why don't you begin with day? If I know that you should say the Shema in the night and in the day, why did you begin with the, with the night? You could have begun with the day. There must be a reason why you begun with the night. What is it? And then the Talmud goes on to explore that very first question. And that's kind of a question that we would ask if we're looking at the Torah, right? We would say, like, why does the Torah say night and not day first? Why does it say first? You know, so, so okay, let's move on. Okay, enough of that. Um, good. Um, okay. Um, according to Jewish law, a child under the age of 13 and one day cannot be found guilty for the wrongdoings that he or she commits. Is this the same as in American law? Go and check and report your findings in the uh, in your answer. At what point in, Jew in, in American law is a child no longer uh, a child um, not responsible for the things that he or she does. You can just email, uh, you can just Google that. You should get it pretty quickly, because here I googled it right here, and here's my answer. Here is, can you press charges on a seven-year-old? Minors under the age of seven generally can't be trialed, tried, even in juvenile court. Their parents, however, may be liable. Children as young as twelve and as old as eighteen are typically taken to juvenile court. But increasingly, prosecutors are trying to try children in this age as adults for very serious crimes. So it seems like in American law, seven is really the cutoff age for even being taken to trial. If you do something horribly wrong, you're not taken to court if it's seven years or younger. Um, why, why, is it, why do you think it's higher in Jewish law? Any ideas for that? All right. Um, 
And I want to show you something really interesting. So uh, one of the things we asked in class was, how, why is it that when it talks about a katan being pator, that a katan is exempt from mitzvot, why is it that it didn't say a katan has not yet had a bar mitzvah, a katan has not yet had a bat mitzvah? Why don't they say that? And one of the ideas we brought up in class, maybe that whole thing was never invented. And actually, look at this, everyone. This is something that is said during a bar and bat mitzvah, and I believe that it's probably the beginning of the ceremony of why we actually have a bar and bat mitzvah, right? Because what would happen is that a dad would bring his son or a dad would bring his daughter to the synagogue, and he would say the following prayer to in front of everyone and then everyone would clap and you would have special drinks and you would you know you would have a have a have a, have a really fun time and gradually it became more of a ceremony but what is this what is this famous blessing that a dad would say he would say the words baruch shep torani he would say baruch atah shem elokinu melech alam shep torani me ancho shel ze God, you are a blessing. You are the ruler of the world. God, you have made me pator from the sins of that person. That person he's pointing to, that person. Who is that person? And what is this trying to say? It's trying to say that up to now, if my child had done something wrong, who was to blame? And after this point, if my child does something wrong, who is to blame? By the way, what do you think? I mean, is that is that high? Is, is that the right age for this transfer of responsibility to happen? Should it be lower? Should it be like seven, or should it be um, should it be higher, like fifteen or sixteen? Make the case one way or another. Give me a few sentences on that. All right. Um, you know this uh, this question of who is to blame really came to my attention um, after the very first school shooting that took place in Columbine. And I remember reading this piece in the New York Times Magazine, and I wanted to share it with you. I thought we were going to be doing it in class, but we'll share it today on the screen. So here we go. Who is to blame? Fact. On Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, Eric Harris, 18, and Dylan Klebold, 17, murdered 13 classmates and wounded 23 others before killing themselves in America's worst instance of school violence to date. Fact. Five years after the killing, Vonda and Michael Scholes, whose child was murdered in the rampage, are asking parents of Harris and Klebold for $250 million and saying the parents should have prevented the rampage by their children. Fact. New York Times Magazine, October 31, 1999, issue covers the controversy. The following quotes are excerpts from the article, Who's to Blame? Mr. Sheol writes, They asked us if we blame the parents. Who else do we blame? I taught my son right from wrong. My son wasn't shooting people up. My son was in the library doing what he was supposed to do. Those parents taught those children to hate. They raised children who hate. I lost a son behind that hate. My child, my children lost a brother behind that hate. Columbine Sheriff Fieger, where were the parents? If you allow a two-year-old to walk around the neighborhood unescorted and he gets hit by a car, you're guilty of child abuse and your other children are taken away. You're equally guilty if you allow your 16 or 17 year old to build bombs in your garage. You have a responsibility to prevent your kids from falling in the swimming pool, but you don't have a responsibility from prevent him from arming himself. Fact. There are laws in Colorado, as there are in nearly half the states, that specifically hold parents responsible for damages done by their children. But these laws are more usually applied to things like vandalism or theft, and the judgment cap is only 3000 $500. Journalist, that question, who else we blame, is one that lingers long after the blood is washed away and classes resume. It is a national question asked by politicians and preachers, and it is a personal one guaranteed to keep parents awake at night. 
Are they to blame when their children turn evil? Are parents responsible when children kill? So, according to your gut feeling, who's to blame? And of course, tell me why. And according to Judaism, or what we've learned so far, who's to blame? All right. Um, and I guess the and I guess this question I kind of asked before, but I'll ask it again in right. Should the age of one who is considered katan change in modern times? Should a Jewish parent be responsible for a child for a longer amount of time because our lifespan is longer? We're not getting married till longer. We're staying under in our parents' house for longer. So uh, tell me what you think about that. All right. Um, right now, we are going to begin an exploration of the Talmud as it relates to the very first Mishnah that we studied. Um, and look, there I am, Rabbi Light, locked up as a Ben Sorer Omore at the end of this unit. One of the great things we'll do is try to get me out of jail. All right. So, but let's move on. By the way, um, we're going to be finding this in something called Masechet Sanhedrin 68b. But before we get there, um, I think it's really important that we kind of ask the question, what is the Talmud? So here is a picture of a Talmud page. You'll see something in the center is, um, is the Talmud itself written in Aramaic. On the sides, we've got some different commentaries. Oh, look at that. Hey, look at that. Here, here's the very first page of the very first, uh, the very first uh, Mishnah on um, on, on Brachot. And actually, I quoted this for Me'ematai Korina Shema Ba'aravit. When do we say the Shema at night? Um, so if you look here, so everything in the middle, it's kind of a beautiful page. Everything in the middle is Tom is well, well, actually, everything right here is Mishnah. And right there, these words g Gimel Mem. That is where the Gemara or the, the Talmud part begins. Um, it's a little confusing because there's Mishnah and Gemara, and altogether it's called Talmud. But sometimes you you sometimes uh, you also call the Gemara part Talmud. So there's Mishnah plus Gemara equals Talmud. That's a good thing to know. On right over here is my friend Rashi, who has a con is you know he did a lot of writing. On this side we have Rashi's grandchildren which often talk more at length. And then we've got some other smaller comments on the on the side, which we won't get, get into. These people over here are called the Tosafot. These people, this is Rashi here, and this is in uh, this is in Aramaic right here. And Rashi, you see, is writing in a special Rashi script. Um, also, his grandchildren are the Tosafot as well. Um, okay. Um, so uh, I think we have... Uh, yeah, but what actually is the Talmud? So, um, first of all, right, we talked about uh, the Israelites come to Mount Sinai and they get the Torah handed to them by God. And at that same moment, God is whispering into Moshe's ear an oral law, which we're calling the Mishnah. At some point in history, that oral law gets written down. Um, why do you think it's written down? That's a question. Uh, why is it written down? It's written down because... Um, you know, there's a fear that it will get lost. There's a fear that um, no one will remember. There's a fear that the level of learning will go. There's a fear that people are just dispersing. Um, so why was the Talmud? Oh, I just talked about that. Okay. Um, okay. So um, now we have now we get the Talmud. So we have, we have, what is the Talmud about? So here we have um, the Mishnah right here. And then we have the Talmud. And so what is the Talmud? The Talmud is primary here because of the big question of what is the Mishnah saying? You know, the Mishnah is, is written down in one specific place. That place is the land of Israel, written down by a guy named Yehuda HaNasi. And then all most of the people, actually, because the Romans kick everyone out of, of Israel, they all head to Babylonia, to Babel. And there they, they, they are wondering, what is this Mishnah all about? I, I don't know what it actually means. And it's uh, defining stuff that's in Israel. What does it mean to us here? And so that's why we start getting this thing called the Talmud, an explanation of what the Mishnah means, an explanation of how it can apply to a new life that's even outside of Israel. So again, here we have that very first page of Talmud broken up, right? We've got the Mishnah right here. 
the Gemara, which is basically questioning the Mishnah, telling us what it means, explaining it. We got Rashi right here. We got Rashi's grandchildren, the Tosafot, right there. So what does the Talmud do? I just explained part of it. But there's another thing the Talmud, the Talmud does as well. The Talmud tries to make sure we understand that the Mishnah, everything that comes in the Mishnah, it's not coming out of thin air. It's not something that's actually made up. It actually is based very specifically on the Torah. The Talmud is trying to link very closely our Mishnah, to the laws in the Mishnah, to the Torah. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, oh, we had that page. Ah. So, um, how does the Talmud work? I've got three off-menu examples. Three examples of how the Talmud works. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one of the examples right now, and then we'll end this, uh, this video a little bit early today. And I will show you two other examples in class. So why do I have a picture of a ping pong match? Some of you actually have taken Talmud class with, with Rav Mendel. And you know that the ping and the pong are a primary characteristic of Talmud study, meaning back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's a debate that goes on back and forth, back and forth. But by the way, Talmud is not just debates. There are great stories, right? We, re we read that, we did that play about um, Eliez uh, Eliezer ben Padat and Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan right in the very first class of our semester in a play form, but that's also in the Talmud. So how do you have this back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure out what's the law? No, this is the law. No, this is the law. No, I think this is the law. And then you have these stories. So there's some kind of, there's this weird thing that happens in the Talmud. First, you have back and forth, back and forth. Oh, that reminds me of a story. Story, 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 story. Back and forth, back and forth. Oh, that reminds me of a story. Back and forth, back. And so it's all kind of mixed up together. And sometimes we're not quite sure where the story begins and where the where the laws begin. But it's all there together. All right. Um, we're mostly going to spend our time in this class looking at the back and forth, which is in Hebrew called, uh, in, in Aramaic called the Shakla Vitaria. Say it with me, Shakla Vitaria, Shakal. Um, yeah, um, so uh, so give and take, like noten velokeach. Give, noten, lokeach, Shakla Vitaria. So that's going to be our big Hebrew word or Aramaic word for the day, Shakla Vitaria. So I'm going to say like, oh, let's go over the Shakla Vitaria on uh, that is that that's part of it's related to this Mishnah. You'll be like, oh. We're going to go through kind of a back and forth. So let's give us, let's go with example number one. So I love this example. This is from a, um, a, a book called Baba Mitzia. And I'll show you all these books in, in class when we get together. Um, by the way, we don't have a normal class this week. We have a, um, a special session where we're having breakfast at 7.50. So come a little bit early. Then we'll have a virtual session from this guy who kind of knows a lot about the most sad, so that should be a fun event. Okay, so here's the question. What if two people find an object at the exact same time and both of those people are 100% certain that that object is theirs? And they swear to it. They swear that it is theirs. What do you do? So um, what do you think you do, by the way? Give me an idea. By the way, this is not related at all to our um, to Stubborn and Rebellious Child, to Ben Surer and Moret. This is just kind of an idea of how the Talmud works. I'm giving you three examples. This is example number one. What if two people find an object at the exact same time and both are 100% certain that it is their object? What do you do? The Mishnah gives us an answer. We divide that object. But here comes the Talmud. Because an object can actually be divided equally into ways. Can you figure out what those two ways are that an object to be divided? So I find an object and there are two ways that I can divide it. Okay. And so the Tom was going to, going to say, sure, I divide, but how? And they're going to give us two positions on the debate. That's step number one. 
we're going to call it for right now the ping position and the pong position. So the ping position says when the Mishnah says divide, here's what it means. It means sell the object and divide the money, right? So if I find a pen, what I should do is I will divide, I will sell the pen, get a dollar back and give each person 50 cents and I'm done. The Pong position says, no, 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 no. When the Mishnah says divide, what it means is divide the object. So for this pen, it means to cut the pen in half. Now, what would be the problem, by the way, with one of these positions if I found a pen? Which actually is problem, how is a pen problematic for one of these positions, the ping position or the palm position? Figure that out. Now, for a pen, one of these positions will be problematic. However, if it wasn't a pen that I found, but a pencil, then all of a sudden it is not problematic. Why? Ah, so a pencil, if I divide in half, right? I can actually sharpen up each of these sides. Sure, it's small, but I could use it, right? The problem is if I were to divide <coughs> this in half, not only could one side not use it, but probably neither side could use it. Maybe the side with the with, with a little bit of ink. But uh, so that's actually problematic. That actually makes me believe that maybe that when the Mishnah says divide, what it means is sell the object and divide the money. That might be the right thing. By the way, before we even start, if I just told you that 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 probably dividing, uh, selling the object and divide and dividing the money is probably the right thing, why is it that the Mishnah might not like that idea? Why is it that the Mishnah might not like the idea of selling an object if it belongs to, uh, if two people believe it so totally belongs to you? And let me give you just an example to use for that to help you with this answer. Suppose what was found was a picture album of your great grandmother. Okay, and both those people said, that's my great grandmother. No, that's my great grandmother. Okay. Okay, and suppose they said, no, actually go sell that object and divide up the money, right? Why is that probably not the best idea? Okay, so that should bring up one issue that makes dividing and selling not so. So okay, so here we go. Now we're gonna go to the Talmud. So here we go, the step one. So here we've got Ping. And Ping is going to ask a question, going to challenge this, uh, challenge the Pong's idea. So here it is. The Ping side wants to show that not all objects can be divided. So what the Mishnah really means by divide is to sell the object and divide that money. Okay, so let's try this out with a scarf. What would the Mishnah say about a scarf? Okay, so kind of write the uh, write the ping side or, or write what 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 the ping side would say. Oh, look, and I have a scarf on, right? So the idea is the mission is trying to prove that you should sell this object and divide the money that you get. Okay, so kind of explain what the mission would say. I find a scarf, and I should sell this object and buy the uh, and 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 divide up the money I get because what would be the problem with cutting it in half. Okay. Ah, okay. And here's the answer. The scarf, when it is divided, is just not usable. Okay. So now we're going to go over to the Pong side. The Pong side has to respond. The Pong side needs to, needs to show that the Ping side is not correct. Okay. This is how Talmud works, right? We got one side and now I'm going to try to disprove that. Okay. I'm going to say, that is completely not correct. You told me that a scarf when I divide it is not usable, but I'm going to show you that what? Okay, what are they gonna do? What does the Pong side want to say and how can the Pong side say it? Okay, and here we go. You seem to think that a small scarf is not usable, but you're wrong. A small scarf is usable. It's usable by a small kid. So you see, 
divide can mean divide. Ah, so right, so we have right here, we have a great, a great situation. Ping side says, a scarf can't be divided. The Pong side says, of course a scarf can be divided. Sure, maybe for not a big person, but a small person. Okay, so now the Ping side has been defeated unless I can find another case in which dividing an object will result in both the finders losing out and, and both and both finders losing out. And it could have used maybe a pen. That, I think I, I wish it had used the pen, but it did. So instead, for some reason, here's what it says. What if the scarf was made of gold? Okay, and this was a scarf used by royalty, right? So if you divide the scarf, and let's just pretend like there's a beautiful, what makes this scarf beautiful is that it has a great pattern and you're going to divide it right in the middle and ruin that pattern, um, right? And then all of a sudden you're saying, if I go and sell, if I go, I have to go and sell it and divide the money because what's, what are, what are two people going to do with a golden, a half of a golden scarf, right? And so this feels like the, the, the ping position feels like, oh, this is a good, this is a good argument to show you why if two people find something, two people say it's theirs, the best thing to do is sell it and divide the money. But the Pong side is going to come up with it with it with with an answer, and they're going to say, "What are you talking about? Of course it's usable. How could a gold scarf, a small, a, a tiny gold scarf, be usable? If a gold scarf we know is used by royalty and not a normal person, what could the Pong side say? Ah, and here's what the Pong side says: um, You seem to think that a small golden scarf isn't usable, but you're wrong. A small golden scarf is usable." Because there are probably some royalty that are also young little kids, and they could use, they could get worn by a small scarf. Okay, so now what we see is we've got we've got the ping side, then the pong side, to the ping side, to the pong side, and right now, if we were to stop right here, we would have seen everything that the ping side says says to tell us that divide must mean sell the object and divide the money. The pong side has rejected. So really, the Pong side could be correct to say we have to mamash, absolutely um, um, cut the object in half and divide it. So now we're back to the Ping side. And of course, the Ping side has got to now try another example or else, um, or else they're going to be defeated. So what's the example they come up with? Ah, here we go. Sure, a golden scarf, a, a normal scarf, a golden scarf, that can't help me. But let's take the case of an animal. I found an animal. Now, what's the problem? If you divide the animal into two, both of those animals are no longer usable. Both parties have lost out, right? Both of them have a half of a dead animal. Um, so really what you should do is go and sell the animal, get the money, divide the money. Okay, now I'm on the ping side. Hmm, how can I show that well, what do I need to do as the pong side to try to try to get the to kind of to disprove the ping's claim? What do I need to do? I need to show that they that an animal that is dead, a half of an a half of a dead animal is actually usable. And what do they say? They say, of course, I can use it. Um, I of course of course I can use it. I can give use it for food, right? I can eat that animal. Eating an animal is a way of using, of benefiting from that animal. Ah, so now we have the pink side. Hmm, what should I do? Should I try a completely new idea? I tried the scarf. I tried the gold scarf. I tried the animal. And instead of trying a completely new idea, they're going to say something about an animal and they're going to say, wait a second, maybe I can figure out a way to show that the animal that if it's divided can't be used for food. So can I think about what could be the case where an animal, if it's divided, it's not only dead, but it can't be used for food. What could that be? Can you think of that? And here's what they say. Ping a, cha a challenge is the pong answer by saying, um, by saying, Sure, that works for a kosher animal, but what if you found a pig 
or some other type of unkosher animal that you are not allowed to eat. So for this reason, the word divide must mean money. Now, I believe there might be a way for our Pong side to respond. What could the Pong side say to show you that even a non-kosher animal could be usable? Ah, but here's the problem. Actually, in Jewish law, you're not allowed to benefit from an unkosher animal. You're not. So, um, so how does the so um, so the pong side says I have no answer. In this case, it's true. You would need to sell the animal, get the money, and divide it. Your position is the correct one. So here's a question. Okay, so we did it. We kind of went through the entire ping and pong. Okay, why, why do we need to go through all this? Why can't I just give me the answer right in the beginning? What's the question? I've got two possibilities of either I divide or I sell, I divide the object or I sell and divide it. Why do we go through the if it's a scarf, oh, no, a scarf is usable. Is it a gold scarf? No, a gold scarf is usable. Is it an animal? No, an animal is usable. What about it? Uh, um, uh, uh, is it, right? What if it's an, an, an unkosher animal? Oh, okay. So why do we go through all of those different kind of levels, back and forth and ping and pong and ping and pong? Why not just give me the answer right like that? And this is what Shakla Vitaria is. Shakla Vitaria is all about. This kind of back and forth, give and take. It's almost as if we're sitting down and watching people in real time have an argument about the uh, uh, about something. And for some reason, the idea is when we have those arguments, more ideas come out. And it's really important that not just the winner gets to have the winner's ideas out there, the loser also has his ideas out there. So we can look at the at, at the person who loses his argument and say, they had some legitimate ideas in here. And I think what we brought up in the beginning was there's a legitimate reason why we don't divide things, why we don't just sell things, I mean, why we don't just sell things off and divide the money. Because that object sometimes is, has value beyond the object itself. Right? If I have an object that's the last thing that I have for my great, great, great grandmother, it's her comb. But if I go and sell that comb in a store, that that person who I'm buying from doesn't care at all about whether that comb belonged to my great. They're saying, oh, every comb I have in the store costs $2. But to you, that comb is worth thousands of dollars, is actually priceless. So in a sense, that's what's going on here. So kind of we have to ask the question, why are they putting so much time into their, um, into their arguments here? And because there's something about keeping the integrity of an object, even if it's divided in half, that was really important to these rabbis. So the winner is obviously our ping side. You divide an object. I mean, you sell the object and you divide it. Like that seems to be the most justice can be had in that case. So everyone gets half uh, something that is usable because the Pong side could result at times where not all the time, but even the smallest possibility that the Pong side could give us a situation where I have received something that I think is just, but in a sense, it's just something that's dead, something that's not usable at all. So that is an example of the Talmud. And I kind of asked the question here for us to kind of end this session and say, so how does the Talmud work? Okay. Um, do we have time for one more? Let's, let's, let's do just one more. Okay. Let's just do one more. Okay. Um, one more piece of Talmud. So um, here we go. Ping and pong example number two. Again, this, these have nothing to do with Ben Surer Moreh. These have just something to do with how does the Talmud work? What is this shock levitaria? Uh, what is this back and forth, this ping and pong all about? So this is a short one, okay? Um, but it's a favorite. And again, if you were in 10th grade, you may have even studied this. So this may be reviewed to you. Lucky, lucky you. Okay, so here we go. 
it starts off with a uh, something that's not in the in the ping position or pong position at all. It's a statement by Rav Huna, which one side is going to say that's completely absurd, and one side is going to say that is completely correct. Okay, so those are going to be a kind of our ping and pong sides. But here's the statement: All who visit the sick lessen that person's sickness by one sixtieth of a sickness. So if you've got a sickness that someone comes in to visit, that act of visiting makes that person a little bit less sick. By the way, that's just a powerful, powerful idea that says someone who visits you when you are not feeling well, they actually make you feel better. They actually take away some of that sickness. By the way, give, give me kind of psychological evidence, like just kind of from your own gut. Why would you think that might be actually true? Um, I don't know how they defined actually one sixtieth, but or how they got that idea. But certainly, it is true that if you go and visit someone and you talk to them, maybe distract them, and maybe you cheer them up, that there is a connection with feeling like I'm not alone in this, feeling like someone is worried and cares about me and loves me. That that does take away some of your sickness. So the rabbis were onto something very psychologically powerful in this statement. By the way, not connected at all to dividing objects, not connected at all to Ben Surya Mareh. I'm just showing you another example of how the Talmud works. Okay, so Rav Huna is not correct is our ping side. Our pong side is Rav Huna is correct. So Rav Huna is not correct. And so what this, what the Rav Huna, the ping side is going to say is, I'm going to show you a situation where Rav Huna, I'm going to take it to its logical logical ending point. And I'm going to show you actually how, how, that what Rav Huna is saying is actually completely false. It's completely false because you're making a claim that the log that 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 logic dictates that it's false. Now, can you figure out what 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 that claim would be on the ping side? If Rav Huna is saying all who visit the sick lessen that person's sickness by one sixtieth. So I'm going to give you a an example. I'm going to give you a hint here. If you if okay, the hint is this: the ping side is saying, if this is so, Rav Huna, if you are correct, I could figure out a way that if someone is sick, I could figure out a way to not make them sick anymore. What would be that way? Okay, and what would be that way? Um, let's see what the Talmud says. Uh huh. If Rav Huna, the pink side says, if Rav Huna is correct, then we should be able to bring 60 people to visit someone who's sick, and that person who's sick should be no longer sick, since each person takes away one sixtieth of the sickness, since this is just not true. And we see people staying sick even though many people visit them. Rav Huna's statement cannot be true. So, um, now, what about the side that says Rav Huna is correct? So here, the pink side has just said Rav Huna's idea of one taking away one sixtieth of a person's sickness is completely untrue. But might there be a way that it could be true? Okay, see if you can figure this out. It's very hard, but uh, but see if you can figure it out. I'm obviously not going to grade you on uh, whether you know the answer, right? But give me something. Give me give give me an idea of how the pong side. Pong side could actually defend Rav Huna. And here's what it says. Of course, Rav Huna's statement is true. You're just looking at it wrong. You think that a sickness of a person has 60 parts, and each person that comes takes away one sixty of that person's sickness. And so in that case, if that's the case, you're correct that one sixty people come and visit, that person should be better. However, this is not what Rav Huna is saying. Is there another way to kind of understand that person's what one sixtieth means? Okay, and here's what it says. What is Rav Huna saying? Rav Huna is saying that the first person who comes to visit takes away one sixtieth of that person's sickness, but the next person who comes to visit takes away one sixtieth of whatever sickness remains. Okay, so that means that. No amount of people visiting will ever get rid completely of a person's sickness because it's only, it's not about, right? It's not that there are 60 parts and each person takes away one part. 
every time people come, they say, whatever sickness there is, that's 100%, and I'm taking away 160th of it. Okay, next person comes up, that's 100%, I'm taking away 160th of it, right? So there's always going to be some kind of sickness that remains, okay? And of course, so the ping is saying this because it's saying, no, look at Rav Huna differently. So Rav Huna's statement is correct. Visitors do help remove most, but not all, of a person's sickness. So how does the Talmud work? Judging using this as our example of the Talmud in play, how does it work? Okay, and we'll do our final uh, example of Talmud in class, and then we'll move specifically into the Talmud piece that has to do with Ben Sorer U Moreh.